welcome to this event, which is uh, um, held here at SOAS and hosted by the Centre for Southeast Asian Studies at SOAS. My name is Ben Murta and I'm co-managing editor of the journal Indonesia and the Malay World and reader in Indonesian and Malay here at SOAS. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this event celebrating the recent IMW special issue of the collected works of Russell Jones with his focus on Malay manuscripts and in particular paper and watermarks. The special issue, expertly edited by my colleague, Dr. Farah Yahya, who will be speaking in a moment, was published in July this year and is available online or in print versions. I should thank my colleague and co-managing editor of the journal, Pauline Kung, for her ever tireless work in preparing the copy for publication and to Emily and Lawrence at Taylor and Francis and other members of the editorial board of IMW who supported this publication in different ways. I should also um, thank and welcome Safran and Myri Jones who are here today um, and who were also most supportive of this issue. Now, I'm sure that Russell Jones was known to many of us here, either in person or through his work. He was lecturer in Indonesian here at SOAS between 1967 and 1985, and was also one of the founding members of Indonesia Circle, which later became Indonesia and the Malay world. Um, and so it's with great pleasure to welcome you all here today for the discussion of his works. I should now introduce my colleague, Dr. Farouk Yahya, uh, Farouk is Research Associate in the Department of History of Art and Archaeology in the School of Arts here at SOAS. His own research interests include the Southeast Asian arts of the book, as well as texts and images relating to magic and divination. He is the author of Magic and Divination in Malay Illustrated Manuscripts, which was published by Brill in 2016, editor of the Arts of Southeast Asia from the SOAS Collections um, from Arika Books 2017 and co-editor of Islamic Occult Sciences in Theory and Practice um, from Brill again uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, but today uh, Farouk is here to discuss uh, Russell's work on paper, watermarks and manuscripts more generally. Um, Farouk is going to talk for 20 to 25 minutes or so um, and after that, we will have time for, for questions and also for um, some comments and, and, and um, memories of Russell. So over to you, Farouk. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for coming and, and, and speaking here today. Thank you very much, Ben, uh, for the introduction. Um, and also thank you very much to the uh, SOAS Center of Southeast Asian Studies, especially uh, Rachel Harrison and Charles uh, Talender Upstel for hosting the event today. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pity you can't have this uh, in person. So otherwise, we could have a bit of you know, makan makan or something. Uh, but on the other hand, the online format uh, of today makes it possible for those outside uh, London to join us. And it's very heartening to see so many people from all across the world uh, joining us for this event today. Uh, so let me just share my screen. I've got a short PowerPoint presentation. So, um, so as Ben mentioned, uh, today's event is to celebrate the recent publication of a special issue of the SOAS based journal Indonesia and Malay World, which gathers together the works of Russell Jones on the paper used for copying uh, Malay manuscripts and watermarks. Now, Russell had been working on publishing a collection of his works on this topic for a very long time, but sadly never got to complete it before he passed uh, in 2019. So the publication of this uh, special issue is intended to go some way towards fulfilling some of his plans, and as a thank you and tribute to one of the founders of this journal. And to me personally, it was a pleasure and indeed an honor to be able to edit a volume of Russell's works, which are so important for the study of Malay manuscripts. Now, although I was never formally one of Russell's students, Russell gave me a lot of guidance and help uh, in my research, um, even going back to when I was first starting my PhD. 
Uh, and indeed in 2015, Russell had actually approached me to help him edit, uh, put together the publication of his collected work. So it felt quite appropriate for me to guest edit this uh, present special issue. Now we owe many thanks to Russell's family, uh, Moya and Stephen Jones for their kind support in the publication of this special issue and for generously sharing Russell's works and materials. We are also grateful to the various publishers, journals, institutions and individuals for their generosity in providing and granting us permission to reproduce the articles and images included in this issue, uh, including Ali Akbar, the Ancient Indian Iran Trust, Association, uh, Archipel, uh, Bodleian Library, Braille Publishing, the British Association of Paper Historians, the British Library, Devon Bassett and Pustaka, the International Association of Paper Historians, the Malaysian branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, Pustaka Anagara Malaysia, Pusat Documentasi dan Informasi Aceh, Claire Reynolds, SOAS, especially the Bulletin of the School of Oriental and African Studies and the SOAS Library Special Collections, the uh, Universita degli Studi di Napoli Orientale, uh, University Malaya, and University of Science Malaysia, especially the School of Social Sciences. Many thanks are also due to the members of the editorial board of the journal for the expert help and advice, especially Helen Cordell, Annabel Gallup, Pauline Kung, and Ben Murta, and many other individuals who help with various aspects of the publication, including Antonia Soriente, Emma Brown, and James Fleming. Um, David Chamberlain, Peter Bauer, and Greth Richel, Tanya Tola, John Weedy, and any others whom I might have missed. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, and finally, thanks also I do to our publisher, Taylor Francis, especially Emily and Lawrence for all their help. Now today, I would like to give a brief overview of the volume, but before we go into that, so let's take a quick look at the man himself. Now, Russell was born in 1926 in Hay on Y in Hertfordshire. When he was 16, he started his first job as a junior clerk with the Shropshire Constabulary in Shrewsbury. He later enlisted in the Royal Marines, and at the age of 19, he was posted to Singapore and Batavia, now Jakarta, following the end of World War II. Now, his experiences in this region led him to enroll for a BA degree uh, in Malay at SOAS. Now, he, Russell interrupted his studies to pursue a career with the colonial service in Malaya, and 10 years later returned to SOAS to complete his degree, graduating in 1960. From 1961 to 1965, Russell was lecturer of Malay at the University of Sydney, before taking up a position as lecturer of Indonesian at SOAS in October 1967, so exactly 54 years ago today. In between all this, he embarked on a postgraduate research degree at Leiden University and later submitted his PhD dissertation at SOAS on the Hikayat Ibrahim ibn Adam, a Malay account of an 8th century Sufi saint. Russell retired from SOAS in 1984, but still kept his association with the university. Russell's scholarly output included studies on a diverse range of topics, such as the etymology of Malay words and early British studies on the Malay language. He also published editions of important Malay texts, including the Hikayat Rajapasai, which is the oldest known Malay historical chronicle. Russell was also instrumental in founding the Indonesian Etymological Project in 1973 which consisted of a group of scholars who worked to identify the origins of Indonesian loanwords. And they published the loanwords, the book, The Loanwords in Indonesian and Malay in 2007 with Russell as the general editor. Now, although Russell is perhaps predominantly known as a scholar of Malay, he also knew Hokkien and conducted research in this area. Russell, for instance, wrote the introduction to a 2007 reprint of the 1899 Dictionary of Amoy Chinese by Carstairs Douglas. And I've just been informed recently that Russell was also the consultant for Malay for the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, this brief account uh, does not do justice to Russell's long and illustrious uh, academic career. So for further information on Russell's life and a list of his publications, uh, please see his obituary in uh, issue 140 of Indonesian Malay World published in 2020. Now during his lectureship at SOAS, Russell put forward a proposal for the founding of an association focusing on the study of Indonesia. 
founded in 1973, it was named Indonesia Circle, and it organized a series of gatherings and published a newsletter, which later evolved into the peer-reviewed journal Indonesia and the Malay World. And indeed, in 2013, Russell contributed an account of the history of the journal for the 40th anniversary of the formation of Indonesia Circle. Now, Russell believed that it was vital to study not only what's written on paper, but also paper itself. He stressed the importance of looking at the manuscript as a whole and was a pioneer in the field of Malay codicology, which is the study of the material aspects of manuscripts like the paper, the ink, uh, the binding, and so on. So by examining the physical features of a manuscript, we can obtain a wealth of information, not only on the production and history of the manuscript itself, but also the society in which the manuscripts was made and used. Now, a major issue affecting the study of Malay manuscripts is that many of them do not have color fonts and do not have dates. Uh, and Russell argued that by investigating the physical features of a manuscript, it can be a very valid can be very valuable in providing an estimate for when and where the manuscript was copied. He applied the study of paper and watermarks. Watermarks is the graphic design used by paper manufacturers, sort of form of a trademark. And you can see an example uh, in my background. Uh, so he applied the study of paper and watermark in his PhD thesis in the, in the 1960s. And over the following decades, he delved deeper into the study of paper watermarks and published a number of seminal articles on this topic, many of which are included within this special issue. Now, as can be seen in the various articles included, his detailed and meticulous investigations has resulted in a number of significant findings. Now, apart from more practical applications, Russell also argued that the study of paper has implications for the broader field of Southeast Asian studies. He argued that it can shed light into the historical connections between Southeast Asia and the wider world and can provide an insight into the economic history of the region. The use of paper imported from Europe, India, and China demonstrates the importance played by trade routes and international networks in the Malay scribal tradition. Russell's work have had a great impact internationally with his articles having also been translated into other languages such as Malay and Persian, so these ones here. However, Russell found that it was not enough to read about paper, but that one also needs to have hands-on experience of the material. In pursuit of this, he spent much time in libraries poring over manuscripts, just in this photo here, and purchased old books just so that he could examine the paper. And he also collected manuscripts from Southeast Asia, which are now kept in the British Library. For example, this beautifully illuminated um, Maulid, Kitab Maulid on the screen here. And he also visited paper mills. Um, so this, he also visited one in Southeast China in 1994. So this is, uh, where he published an article about it in 2002. Now, Russell's superior knowledge on paper and watermarks have led many scholars and students to seek his help, and he freely shared his knowledge with anyone who contacted him. He was even referred to by Cyril Skinner in 1982 as the Sherlock Holmes of the world of Malay manuscript, a comparison that Russell was particularly delighted about. So I found one of his old PowerPoints and he had this slide at the end of uh, his presentation. So I thought it was quite amusing. Russell was an active member of the academic community and was part of a number of associations. He is the longest serving member of the Malaysian branch of the Royal Asiatic Society. And he was also one of the founders of the British Association of Paper Historians, as well as a member of the International Association of Paper Historians. Uh, Russell's interest in paper even extended towards trying to produce it himself. After retiring from SOAS in, in uh, nine, after retiring from SOAS in 1987, he moved to Cornwall with the intention of restoring an old watermill to produce paper. Although this venture was not successful, Russell continued to conduct research on the paper mills and paper makers in Cornwall during the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, so this is an example of a paper mill in, in Cornwall. 
So his material on this topic, his research on this topic has been deposited at the Crescent Kernel Archive in Red Roof in uh, Cornwall. For many years, Russell had wanted to disseminate his knowledge to future generations of scholars, librarians, and archivists. He wanted to do the following. Firstly, to set up an online database of watermarks based on manuscripts and documents produced in Southeast Asia. He also wanted to train scholars to continue uh, his work in investigating paper and watermarks, uh, specifically in the form of conducting a workshop. He wanted to set up a dedicated center for the study of Malay codicology, which would also host uh, the website, the online database, and also have a small library. And finally, he also wanted to publish a book on paper and watermarks. Russell spent many years working on these, and in 2015, he obtained a generous grant from His Royal Highness Sultan Nazrin Shah, uh, Sultan of Perak, for, to help with his efforts, but sadly passed away uh, before his plans could be brought into fruition. So this special issue of Indonesia and the Malay world is therefore a step towards an, an implementation of Russell's plans. He had been planning the publication for, for a while and it was to consist of a compilation of his previous articles on paper and watermarks, together with some introductory chapters on the history and characteristics of paper, some guidance on how to investigate, it, how to investigate paper and watermarks, a bibliography and index and some appendices. So this special issue includes 17 published articles that Russell had selected in his original book proposal. Uh, but unfortunately, the supplementary material that Russell had originally planned to include, such as the chapters on the history of paper, either could not be located or are in very draft form. So they uh, regrettably they had to be excluded from the present special issue. So, but in their place, I've added a couple of unpublished works uh, by, art, by Russell on the use of Chinese paper and Malay manuscripts. So, uh, so these are the contents of the special issue. Uh, it begins with an introduction by myself, which gives a background on Russell's work on the topic, as well as, as, well as an overview of the articles that are included. The earliest article is number 15, which is the dating of MS Max 193 in the Royal Asiatic Society, which first appeared in the Journal of the Malaysian Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, uh, volume 45, um, 1972 issue, although it's published in January 1973. And the latest is number 14, which is um, Chinese paper used for Malay, uh, for manuscripts in the Malay world, which, which is an unpublished paper uh, from 2014. However, as you may notice, uh, the articles are not arranged chronologically, but instead are divided by themes and split into three parts. So the first part, history, gives an account of the history of the Malay manuscript tradition and the types of paper that were used. Um, so paper, paper is basically made uh, by macerating fiber and mixing it with water to form a pulp, which is then sieved. Now this technique was invented in China and knowledge of paper making later spread to the Islamic world, Europe and India. Russell's uh, 1993 article, uh, European and Asian Papers in Malay Manuscripts, a provisional assessment, uh, which is number three in the issue. Let me just forward it. Uh, number three in this issue investigates the impact of these regions upon the use of paper in Southeast Asia. Uh, Russell found that uh, while there's some evidence for the use of Indian and Chinese papers, these are sort of rather limited. They constitute only about 5% of the extant corpus of Malay manuscripts. In contrast, the usage of European paper uh, was, was uh, much more ubiquitous, uh, which, and they constitute the vast majority of surviving Malay manuscripts. And European paper can be easily identified by the presence of watermarks, such as these ones here. Now, the use of European paper accompanied the expansion of Western powers in Southeast Asia. By the 18th and 19th centuries, the Dutch and the British were among the main suppliers of paper in uh, maritime Southeast Asia. So the one on the left, the Dutch line is basically a Dutch watermark and the one on the right, uh, Watman is a, is a British uh, company, British paper maker. 
There was additionally uh, another stream of European paper that existed outside colonial channels. This comprised paper from Italy, which Russell investigated in his 1998 article, Crescent and Eagle Watermarks in Malay Manuscripts, which is number four in the special issue. Watermarks commonly found in this type of paper include three crescent moons in a row, see this one on top left, uh, a moon face, such as these ones here, where the crescent moon has a human face in the profile, and a double-headed eagle. Unlike Dutch and British paper, the use of Italian paper in Southeast Asia did not have colonial connections. Now, Italian paper was widely used in Egypt, and from there it was re-exported to other parts of Africa and also to Arabia. So Russell uh, proposed that Italian paper was exported into Southeast Asia from Mecca, and he also raised the possibility that the import of Italian paper into Southeast Asia replaced an earlier trade of Islamic paper into the region. The second part of the special issue methodology provides some guidance on the techniques that can be used to investigate paper and record the information, as well as future steps to take the studies forward. As paper used for Malay manuscripts are commonly of European manufacture, watermarks can also provide a clue uh, to the date of a manuscript. And he discusses this uh, in his 1988 article from Paper Mill to Scribe the Lapse of Time, which is number nine uh, in this special issue. Determining the date of a manuscript can be done in a number of ways, depending on whether the watermark is dated or undated. A watermark that has a date, and these are typically uh, those of British manufacture, can produce the earliest date in which a manuscript could have been copied. But in, in this research, Russell found that two thirds of the Malay manuscripts were copied within four years of the manufacture of the paper, and more than 90% were copied within eight years of the manufacture of the paper. If, however, if a, man, a watermark uh, does not have a date, there are other methods which can use to date a manuscript. One way is to compare the watermark against other variants of the design. For instance, for the watermark Guthrie & Co, after 1903, the watermark became Guthrie & Co Limited, which reflects the name change of the company. So this watermark on the screen, for example, would be dated after 1903 because it has limited at the end. Another method is to look at dated manuscripts containing the same watermarks as the one we're querying about. So there are a number of European watermark catalogs, such as those by Edward Hayward and William Churchill. However, Russell strongly cautions against using them for dating Malay manuscripts. This is because the examples given in these publications only go up to 1800, whereas Malay manuscripts are predominantly later from the 19th century. So relying upon them for dating Malay material can therefore lead to misleading results as watermark designs were often used for a very long time. Instead, Russell argued that a better approach would be to create a corpus watermarks specifically based on Southeast Asian material and use them to date manuscripts through a form of cluster analysis. So this is why an online database of watermarks that Russell had suggested would be very helpful. Russell explains this um, in his 1988 article, uh, Western Batman Oriental Scribe, which is number 10 in this issue. And he says, I quote, what we have to do is look up, to look up all the manuscripts you have noted with that watermark. If we then observe the dates of those manuscripts which have been dated, we have a cluster of dates within which with reasonable confidence, we can date the queried manuscript. Other look through characteristics of the paper are equally important to be noted. In his 2011 article, Watermark Icons or Words, with reference to methods of dating Malay manuscripts, which is number 11 in the special issue, Russell notes that chain lines, uh, so chain lines are basically lines that appear on the paper as a result of the wires from the paper mold. So chain lines are also helpful in identifying the type of paper and its date. 
Uh, Russell has observed that the presence of chain line shadows, so shadows along the chain lines, also known as bar shadows, indicate that the paper was made prior to the 19th century, um, and which therefore gives another method for dating paper. So here are two examples of chain lines. The one at the top has shadows uh, along the lines, and the ones that the paper at the bottom doesn't. So the one at the top would date to before 1800, while the one at the bottom would date to after 1800. So far, the discussion has been focused on the investigation of European paper. Asian paper, however, can be more difficult to ascertain, but they have certain characteristics that can help to identify uh, them, uh, particularly in regard to Chinese paper. So Russell discusses this uh, in an unpublished paper that he presented uh, at the study day, study day on Indonesian manuscripts at the British Library in 2001, titled Some Remarks on Narrow Chain Line Intervals in Paper with Particular Reference to Chinese Papers, which is number 13 in the special issue. So in Asian paper, the intervals between uh, some chain lines are narrower than other intervals. So basically in European paper, the chain lines are, are in regular intervals, but in Asian paper, they're not. Uh, and usually there's some of them are narrower than the others and they usually appear uh, sort of in pairs or in threes. So um, this manuscript of the Hikaya uh, Sri Rama in the Bodhin Library has this sort of pattern uh, of chain line intervals. And also you might uh, be interested to know that the paper, this paper of this manuscript also has a Chinese seal, which denoted the, paper, the maker or distributor of the paper indicating that it was uh, of Chinese origin. And recently Annabel Gallup and Kawashima Midori have identified several other manuscripts from maritime Southeast Asia with similar papers bearing Chinese seals. And Russell discusses this uh, these findings in an un unpublished article from 2014, uh, Chinese paper used for manuscripts in the Malay world, which is number 14 in the special issue. The third part uh, of the special issue application highlights a number of case studies that show how Russell had uh, applied techniques, um, codicological techniques uh, to date manuscript based on their codicological features. He demonstrated this, for instance, in, um, in, a, in a 1983 article, an essay at dating and description of a Malay manuscript, which is uh, number 18 in this special issue, which he co-authored with Claire Roundtree, uh, now Claire Reynolds, uh, who was a paper conservator at the British Library. Taking a manuscript in the British Library, Russell showed uh, how the results produced by examining the characteristics of the paper and the history of a manuscript can tally with the date given in the colophon, which in this case uh, is 1802. In 2004, Russell donated uh, to SOAS Library his collection of beta radiographic negatives and prints of watermarks together with the register and the equipment used to create them. Uh, this is the I believe the single most comprehensive collection of watermarks of Malay manuscripts. The register of, this, uh, of these watermarks is published for the first time in the appendix of the present uh, issue. The watermarks listed in the 121 entries consist of reproductions made at SOAS between 1980 and, 19, between 1980 and 1990, and also includes a few watermarks from the collection of uh, Terence Waltz in New York. Uh, each entry is accompanied by details of the manuscript um, or the book the image was taken from, including its date, which is a key element which will help us um, in, in dating other manuscripts with similar watermarks. The special issue ends with a brief postscript. Uh, it is based on an extract from the concluding chapter of his proposed book, and it provides a summary of the main points that have been covered. So we hope that this special issue of Indonesia and the Malay world will be a useful resource for the study of Malay codicology, uh, particularly on paper and watermarks, and of for Malay uh, manuscript studies more generally. In doing so, it will fulfill Russell's wish to impart the deep knowledge he had acquired over his long career to future generations. The works compiled in this issue are a testament to Russell's dedication to the field of Malay codicology. 
we would like to thank Russell Jones, without whom uh, none of this would have been possible. Uh, we are honored to have had the opportunity to work with him and learn from his guidance. And this special issue is a mark of our appreciation for his unending efforts, support and generosity, both for establishing and developing the journal into what it is today, and also for advancing uh, the field of uh, Malay manuscript studies. Um, so all right, uh, rest in peace, Russell. So thank you very much. Um, over to you, back to you, Ben. Thank you very much indeed, Farouk, for that. Um, we have an hour altogether for our session today. Um, it's just gone half past 11, so that means we do have time for, for questions, we have time for um, memories of, of, of Russell and his, his work and, and, and him as a, a scholar and as a person. So if anyone would like to um, say something, um, please just raise your hand and my colleague Charles can sort of, um, will allow you to, to speak. Or if you wish to put anything into the question box, um, you can do that as well. And then I can read out the, the, the question for you. I can see that it seems like we have about 80, well, I think we had a maximum of 87 people. I know people drop in and drop out of this. And it really is great to see so many um, friends and colleagues from across the world at the event. Um, it would be great to hear from any of you, any of your thoughts on Russell's work and, and, and so on. So please do um, put up your hand if you'd like to speak and please be brave and go first. I think while everyone else is thinking of a question, I'm just gonna put you on the spot, Farouk, and say, can you give us an example of where you've actually used um, this catalog of, 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 of watermarks and so on to, to, to try and date a piece of work of your own? Is, is there an incident where, could, an instance where, where you can, can use this for yourself? I know that yeah. I, when I, when I first met Russell, um, when I was working on my MA dissertation, you know, as, as, as is noted um, in, in, in Russell's obituary, you know, the first thing he said to me was, what about the paper? And, and, and then I, I immediately, <laughs> it hadn't occurred to me to look at the watermark. So back I went to the Royal Asiatic Society to look at the watermark and, 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 and so on. But Faru. Yes, yes, I have used um, Russell's knowledge. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I, didn't, I emailed him. Uh, whenever I had a question about a manuscript and trying to date it, I would send him photos of the watermark and he immediately would reply, you know, so this watermark has been found in another manuscript of this date and that date. So your manuscript was probably dates around a similar time period. Um, so, so Russell is very helpful to me in that sense. And I've also applied it myself, this cluster analysis uh, for whenever I find a watermark, um, I try to look up what I, I try to look up myself without consulting, without needing to consult Russell, what other manuscripts contain also the same watermarks. And by that, again, I can, you know, help to uh, figure, uh, 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 you know, a time, time period arranged um, for to place my manuscript within a time frame. So, so I have used his methods uh, quite a lot, actually, and they're very helpful. Now we have um, what a hand raised by one Ali, one Mama. Um, Charles, are you able to? Yeah, so welcome. Um, far away with the question. Hopefully you can speak now. Um... Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, first, congratulations to brother Dr. Farouk for making the uh, collection of articles by Dr. Russell Jones possible to be published. The, it brings to me good memory of my relationship with uh, Dr. Russell Jones because uh, in uh, 1987, I was doing my master in library science in UCL, University of London. And he was my lecturer. And when I did the uh, short essay or long essay, which uh, in Malaysia we call it uh, uh, thesis, mm -hmm. uh, he supervised me and uh, he guided me 
and showed me uh, his works. And he, I think a few of the papers that has been published, he showed me when I was uh, uh, a student under his guidance. And I think, and I also visited his house and his uh, study, uh, his study apartment. Mm -hmm. And I heard just now, the wife of uh, Dr. Russell Jones and his daughter is here. I cannot remember their names, but I remember I visited the house and I saw the daughter uh, at that time, maybe about six or seven months old. And I met the, the, the wife also. So uh, it brings me good memory uh, of, of my teacher, Dr. Russell Jones, when I attend this uh, session. Uh, I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much for that. What a, what a lovely memory to start. And I think so many of us here have, have um, sort of worked with, with Russell in so many different ways as, as, as you know, many of us were, were sort of his either official or unofficial student. Um, others will have worked alongside him as colleagues, but that, that, that's a lovely memory. Thank you very much for that. I can see that we had a question in the box um, about the, the equipment in the library from, from Davin Chamberlain. With, is the beta radiography equipment still at SOAS? If so, is it still operational? And is there any possibility of it being used? I think you've answered, we need to ask the special collections, Ferry. Yes, Anything else? I think so, yes. Yeah, so get in touch with the special, if, if you, you know, it, it, send an email to the special collections. So I think they're gonna be closed for a few months coming up now, but normally it's, it's quite possible to visit the, the in, in normal times at least, it's, it's possible to go in and visit the special collections, but, but do ask them about that equipment at least. Um, I can see now we have a question, uh, hand raised by uh, Dr. Annabel Gallup of the British Library. So maybe Charles, you can, yeah. I think you're okay. on. Okay, C can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Right. Um, yes, well, thank you so much. What a wonderful tribute, um, Farouk. And it's wonderful, Moya and Saffron, that you're attending to. Um, I was probably one of the, the last cohort to be actually taught by Russell at SOAS. I arrived in 1983 for my MA, my Master's in Indonesian and Malay Studies, and Russell taught me um, traditional Malay literature for that first year. Um, I have to say, I always found Russell a bit, I mean, I learned so much from him from, you know, I, I studied, you know, the Sajara Malayu, Hikayat Raja Pasai, or, you know, the major works with him. He, I found him a bit remote at that time when I was at SOAS, and it's really only helping with the notes towards his obituary, so sadly, that I realised that there was a lot going on on that behind the scenes that as a student, you wouldn't know that he had quite a lot of sort of difficulties with, you know, um, problems with SOAS itself. And so it was, um, I was attending SOAS for a two year masters and it came as a great surprise when Russell um, very suddenly took early retirement at the end of my first year. So in, in 1984. Um, but I've known Russell ever since. And what I think is so extraordinary about Russell is that most um, scholars, you know, get are very active in their middle years and then gradually sort of <laughs> fade away. But Russell, the opposite happened. He got busier and busier and busier. And we were just in awe of him that, you know, right into his 80s and even his early, you know, 90s, um, his overriding um, ambition Mission, um, was to impart his knowledge um, about the importance of, um, of Malay manuscripts and their paper and, the, and their watermarks. And all he, you know, all his time was devoted to trying to ensure that all the knowledge that he had gathered would be imparted. And so, you know, even extending to a visit to Indonesia in his 80s when he was hosted by um, Amin Sweeney and, um, you know, who, who, who followed him around, sort of propping him up and sort of making sure that he, he was he was looked after at all stages. Um, but I think all of us who knew him, particularly in his later years, just could not fail to be um, absolutely so impressed and, and, and touched and, and um, humbled by his 
dedication to ensuring that his um, that his knowledge was passed on to future generations. So that's my overriding um, impression of Russell is really how um, his stature as a scholar just sort of grew and grew and grew, you know, um, it right up to the very end of his life. Thanks. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Um, any more comments or, or, or questions or, or, or memories from, from guests? I, I know that there are so many of you. Ah, I have Peter, Peter Bauer, Peter Bauer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, I had the privilege of knowing Russell for, I don't know, over 40 years. Uh, I'm the president of the British Association of Paper Historians who published several of the articles in the, this recent commemorative volume. And I also have personal memories because uh, as a child, I lived in Penang. And at the time, though we never worked out whether we could possibly have ever met, uh, Russell was uh, 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 working in, in Penang. We, if we did ever meet when in the 1950s, it would have been probably at Penang Cricket Club, uh, a, a beautiful cricket pitch. But it was a delight to know him. And I do have a question for Farouk. Who now is work in your field is actually working on paper, watermarks and things? Or are people just generally using uh, the, the, the basis of what Russell set up? But it, is there ongoing research into this? Mm, I guess... Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for the uh, for the comments. Uh, just to answer your question, I guess I guess I'm doing uh, some research on watermarks. I always, whenever I look at manuscripts, I do try to take note of what watermarks they are, and um, so I like to think that I try to continue some of Russell's works. And in fact, I did um, give a course on codicology of Malay manuscripts at the Islamic Arts Museum, Malaysia, a few years ago. I did try to incorporate some of his research in that. Um, so in terms of codicological studies, it's something that I personally am interested in. Um, but I know others have also uh, utilized his works. And um, I know that libraries, many libraries are now starting to uh, value paper and watermarks. And for, for example, the National Library of Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur do take note of what watermarks are found in uh, in the manuscripts that they they own, uh, they have um, whenever they publish catalogs. So I believe that that's possibly might be due to Russell's influence. So um, so 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 that's that's it. So. Oh, yes, thank you very much in, indeed for that, Peter. And 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 again, thank you so much for for the help in you know. The, the republishing of the, of the papers, it, it's very much appreciated that we are able to get all of that together. Are there any other questions from the floor or any other comments that people want to, to write in with? We still have 15 minutes, so we'll be most grateful for any memories, any more information on work that Peter would do. Ah, Stuart Robson, please. Um, Stuart. Yes, hello. Can you hear me there? We can, yes. That's wonderful. I uh, represent the group of students who uh, were taught by Russell at the University of Sydney in the early 60s, going back a long way. And uh, particularly grateful to him and to his uh, introduction to classical Malay studies there. And he actually uh, introduced me to a Malay hikayat called the Hikayat Andakan Panurat, which uh, was just a unique manuscript from the Leyden collection. And uh, I managed to use that to uh, form a little uh, MA thesis for Sydney. And that uh, really saved my, uh, my, my career at that point. Uh, after that, I shifted to uh, Javanese studies, but uh, I remember very gratefully how Russell assisted at that time. 
So it's particularly happy to see that uh, this uh, volume has been compiled. Thank you for all your hard work there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Any other questions, comments, memories? Everything will be my ah, we have here uh Muhammad, Muhammad Adib Muhammad. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Ben and, and Dr. Farouk, for the presentation for the event. Uh, I'm from Malaysia. I have never been to SOAS, um, or, or I, and I don't know um, uh, Russell personally, but um, I'm, I'm really privileged to have, have, have seen this event from Malaysia. Uh, my question is about the watermarks. Um, and, and, you know, you, I think Dr. Farouk mentioned, if I'm correctly, that they can tell us something about the trade, the use of trade in uh, about the trade patterns in the area. I'm wondering if Dr. Farid, Farid could elaborate on that point about what it can tell us about social and economic history. Um, and in particular, in particular, what it can tell us about the history of, of religion in the region, because um, you know, Quranic manuscripts would have their own watermarks. Um, I'm wondering if that can actually give us a clue to something of the social history um, underlying, well, in particular, Islamic manuscripts, but just manuscripts more generally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do I have to lower my hand? I think I'll I'll think the I think I'll, yeah. I will. Right. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for coming today, and thank you for the question. It's an interesting question um, about trade. So, so the main paper based on the watermark, the main types of paper we have uh, basically British paper, Dutch paper, um, and also in, in Philippines and the Spanish paper as well. Um, so, so they, you can argue that they, you know, these, uh, these types of paper came into Southeast Asia, began to be used through colonial channels. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, um, Italian paper, on the other hand, was outside that. So, and so one of the questions which Russell was uh, asking, you know, how the Italian paper became to be used in Southeast Asia and um, so what, what trade networks facilitated the importation of Italian paper into the region? Um, and he found that he thinks that maybe, as I mentioned, it probably came from the Middle East uh, and probably replaced a trade of Islamic paper uh, uh, into the region. And also, he also found, he also thought that um, Italian paper also seemed to be more used in religious works, uh, especially he found it being used in Aceh amongst religious works. So it seems like there's sort of a um, sort of um, a, a different stream of trade uh, involved with Italian paper compared to British and Dutch paper. And in fact, British and Dutch paper it's one, uh, it's one question that asked him before. Uh, so, you know, is British paper only used in Malaysia and Dutch paper only used in Indonesia? And he said, no, it, uh, these, pa these types of paper, uh, you know, move, also move across. So they're not limited by colonial uh, territory. So again, they must be traded in some way. And there's also another type of paper which also discusses, uh, which also discussed in the special issue on, um, that's the Smith and Mania paper, which is from Croatia. And that seems to be, um, I think, imported via Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. So, so you know, the trade of paper can show um, how the economic history of the region. And this is, uh, and also actually, also Asian paper, uh, which is, hasn't been researched as much, can also show um, how, you know, uh, inter-Asian inter networks, inter-Asia trade networks, uh, how paper move and much give an indication of how other uh, things move uh, across the region as well. So that's a very short answer to, to your question. It's very complex. So um, yeah, you might want to read uh, Russell's uh, writings, which he discusses some of these uh, issues in the special issue. Thanks. Thank you, Farouk. I can see we have um, Kamaria has her hand raised. And after that, uh, and Zahara Wan, and then after that, there's also a, a comment or a question from Alex Teo in, in, in the box, but maybe we can have Kamaria um, first. 
Hello, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ben, uh, can yes, you hear we, me? We can hear yes, good. Yes, you. Yes, yeah. good. alaikum, uh, Dr. Farouk. Yeah, I'm Kamaria from Malaysia. Uh, yeah, just now, I uh, uh, th there was in the presentation that uh, Dr. Farouk mentioned about the database of uh, watermarks, which is part of the dream of Dr. Russell's. Uh, if I miss on that part, is it uh, available or is there any plans uh, by the uh, UK counterpart uh, to build or develop the watermarks uh, so that it can be accessed uh, for uh, any manuscript lovers, uh, especially in Malaysia? Thank you. Salam. Uh, 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 thank you for the question. Um, yeah, about the watermark database, I think Dr. Russell was still trying to get that going. So I don't think it ever actually uh, materialized in the end. I don't think it actually happened in the end. He was trying to find uh, a way to, you know, how to, um, how to create the Data mark, uh, watermark database and how, where to upload it as well. So I don't think he ever got very far with it, uh, but I know that he wanted to um, do the database based on his, his own collection of uh, watermarks. Uh, so unfortunately at, the, at this moment in time, I don't, think, um, I don't think it's been done. So I don't think it's been uh, done yet, so. Thank you, Farouk. Um, before we go to, Zahara, there's a, a question here from Rosmawati Ahmad Zakaria. Thank you for that question. My question, do you have any idea on how this paper arrived in the Malay world? Was it in big rolls or was it already cut? So do you know about the, the actual physical process of, 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 of how the paper was brought over and how it was worked with? Mm. That one, I'm not sure. I think it might be in rolls and reams of paper. Um, I'm not quite clear about that. Uh, I think Russell might have discussed it in one of his articles. I can't quite remember. But other people might have a better idea about this. Um, I mean, more paper historians might know more or economic historians might know more about this. So if anyone knows the answer to, to that one, either type it in a box or, or put your hand up. But I will now come to Zahara, Zahara Wan. Okay. Zahara. Hi, hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, excuse my voice. Just to say that um, my husband and I have these beautiful memories of a weekend spent with Russell and Moya at their home in Cornwall. And the weekend was just not enough. We were taken to his study where he showed us some of his papers and some watermarks. But I was more interested in his letters from Malaya, letters that he sent to his parents from Malaya, where he was based. So they're very beautiful letters, beautifully kept in biscuit tins. So I'm very interested to read and study these letters. And he had actually sent some copies to me. So there's so much to see. And like I said, uh, a weekend is just not enough. And, but I did a video I will visit mostly in his study. That's great. Thank you very much for that memory, Zahara. Um, I'm now going to go to Peter Bauer again. Um, maybe you're going to tell us something about paper again. Yes, it, it's in answer to the previous que the question about how did the paper arrive there. Until the advent of machine-made paper, all paper was made in single sh as single sheets and they would have been packed in reams of about 480 to 500 sheets in a ream. Mm -hmm. And basically, you bought a ream, or you shipped several reams, or 10 reams, or 100, or whatever. By the uh, beginning of the 19th century, for, in Britain, you are getting machine-made paper, which was actually made in rolls. And... The, it was probably still ex exported as sheets because the stationers would have trimmed it and cut it to the sizes that most people wanted. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. It does, it's really useful. Thank you so much. It just shows how, how great it is to always have a paper historian at a talk. Thank <laughs> you very much indeed for that. Thank you. 
Uh, did you did you have any comments, Farouk, on the 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 the, the question comment from Alex Tao about um, many watermark information are now documented as part of the many digitalization projects by libraries Dream C and also Conservation Works. Is there a way to accumulate um, this watermark information? Mm, so I think I mean all this uh, documentation of these digitization projects. Um, how to come how to accumulate this watermark information? I think that's something I think Russell was quite keen to do, you know, uh, accumulate as many uh, watermarks as possible into a sort of a database. Um, I'm not sure how, um, well, how to go about doing this. And um, I don't know, I think you'll need uh, lots of cooperation with various libraries and institutions in order to, to, to generate such, such, such form of um, information and gather them into a sort of a database as well, so. It sounds almost like it's a project out there for someone with the energy and the will um, to yeah. and, and, and political knowledge of, of the various institutions to almost make it happen. Yeah. And any more questions from from anyone? I, I can see that. Peter, is that your hand raised again? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, regarding watermarks databases. Um, it's been calculated that uh, just in Western Europe, there are probably about six and a half million different uh, watermarks over from the 12, 1270 onwards. Um, probably 300,000 of those have actually been published in printed watermark catalogues. There's probably about half a million in various institutional um, collection databases. Um, which are only basically accessible to uh, people who work in those places. Uh, to catalogue every watermark and have a comprehensive database um, is, is almost complete madness. Uh, I'm not sure people have got long enough lives. <laughs> Well, that, I think that's therefore a, a, a good tip, Peter. Well, I, if, if a moment I was, ago I was saying it was a good project, I, I guess the idea that it's complete madness, then, then we, there are some caveats involved in this. Yeah. Although I think Russell did say that in terms of Southeast Asia, I think there's only a very limited number of watermarks that we actually use. So, so it might be uh, a smaller scale than, than that. So. Well, We've reached our time now. It's about 12 o'clock. So we, we've reached our allocated hour. Um, I don't see any more hands raised. So I'm at this point just going to say thank you very much indeed to everyone who's, who's, who's come to the, the talk today. It's been really great to have you all here to see names from around the world. I guess it's one of the advantages of, 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 of the learnings from COVID and so on that we can have such a panel of, of such an international scale. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you very much indeed, Faru, for, for putting this together um, for the, the special issue and also the talk today. If anyone has been unable to access um, this special issue for whatever reason, um, maybe send Farouk or myself an email or a message or something and we will try to make sure that you can access it. Um, and other than that, I just say thank you to everyone involved. Thank you to IMW, the editorial board. Thank you to Center for Southeast Asian Studies uh, for hosting this event. Um, thank you to all the publishers and, 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 and friends and colleagues who, who assisted in, 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 in making sure that we could get the permissions for this paper, uh, for, for the special issue. Um, so thank you everyone. Have a good evening, have a good night, have a good morning. Have a good afternoon, wherever you are, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much indeed.